Thanks for joining. I'm Ayush, a senior machine learning engineer at Pinterest. Today in this particular talk, we would be going over some of the practical lessons that we had from scaling the ads ranking model from very simplistic logistic regressions in like 2014 to more complex transformer model recently. And we'll covering this journey and what are the best lessons that we have from the same. Just to recap, like what Pinterest is, Pinterest is a visual inspiration engine and our mission is to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life that they love. Now to bring this experience, Pinterest has many touch points. Like the first screen that you see on the homepage is called the home feed. This is using your past interest and past engagements about what the platform knows about the user. This is like one touch point. And the other touch points that you can have is through a search query. Like you can see a bar on the top. This is where you can enter a search text or do a visual query. Thirdly, the another touch point is around related pins. Like once you click on a particular image, if you're excited to know more about, you might be also be able to see more visually similar pins. Now let's see how ads enter into the ecosystem. Like ads are the content that are promoted by advertisers, which help to connect users with the relevant content, bringing the right inspiration. On this particular scene, like promoted by is the symbol, how you can identify ads on the platform. So just before we go into what kind of models are behind these ranking systems, like these are some of the characteristics which define what kind of models that you can use. Pinterest has billions of content, so we should be able to swift through this content in low latency as fast as like 200 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. We need to make sure that we are able to be performing predictions to be scaled up around like 460 million monthly active users. And these predictions are need to be made in real time. So the design choices that we make in terms of the ranking models need to adhere to these characteristics. These also need to be responsive to the user feedback, which can change as quickly as like within a minute or so. And just to give a very brief overview of the complexity of the ads ecosystem, like this is how ads product can look in a nutshell. Like different advertisers can have different objectives that they want to cater to. It could be as simple as just creating brand awareness for the content on the platform or driving more clicks on the platform. Advertisers can choose how they want to spend the budget that they have. They can choose among different images, like different creative type, which could be as simple as an image. Now to bring this product through different advertisers, different kind of content, the platform needs to understand like what is a good likelihood or like what's the good probability of showing a particular content to the user. This is where the predictions come in and where the majority of machine learning comes in in general. So we need to decide like what's a click, good click would be for a user on a particular content at a particular time. For these, we have machine learning models. Now, just looking at clicks might not get the best picture to the users because clicks might be promoting more clickbaity content on the platform. To understand user behavior, there are other kinds of predictions that the platform makes around good clicks, hides, saves, and relevance in general. Now, you can imagine, like for each of these machine learning objectives, you can have different machine learning models to maintain. Apart from that, this can keep on growing in terms of complexity. You can have other kind of awareness goals or marketing goals from the advertisers, driving content, not only on Pinterest, but outside the Pinterest platform. Now imagine if you want to make this system more complex by having more images, instead of images, we want videos on the platform, another kind of collections or another creative type. Not only the platform would need to predict and understand what good these predictions are, but it also needs to make new predictions in general. Behind each of these are different machine learning models, which can keep on growing and becoming more complex. If you look at the complexity, there could be different surfaces like home feed search and related pins where the user has different characteristics. Now, as the product keeps growing in its iterations, we need to ensure that you can manage this complexity of product growth in a linear manner and not exponentially as you start keep on adding more complexities. So over time, we made some design decisions and choices that help us to manage this complexity in terms of our ranking models. Just before we go into what the ranking model looks like, like this is a typical delivery funnel for a recommendation system. There are a set of candidate generators that run in parallel, whose main goal is to identify the best set of ads or content that you can show to the user. These are then passed into blending and filtering logic controlled through business use cases, passed into a ranking model whose main objective is to create precise predictions. And then these are passed into the auction and allocation phase and then shown to the user on their feed. So this is like a very typical to a recommendation system. And in this particular talk, we will be focusing on this ranking model and what goes behind this ranking model and how it evolved over time. Starting in 2015, the first model was a very simplistic logistic regression based model. This is the simplistic model in, in machine learning in general. 
as we started to see, as we started to make progress in general, in terms of both the product growth, as the product started to scale, the next set of iterations that happened was to make this model more complicated. This is a very seminal architecture in the industry. Many companies would have gone through the same route. The next set of improvements that come here is to utilize more like nonlinear translations through like gradient boosted decision trees and a combination of logistic regression. Just to give an idea what this means is like this, this is what gradient boosted decision trees. Like if you have learned about decision trees, this is just like a combination and ensemble of different decision trees through gradient boosting. What you can see is like in terms of your features, there are four kinds of features that are more prevalent. One is around like user features that try to understand the user. The other is around your content feature, which tries to understand the content or like content or the pins on the corpus. The third set of features are user and content interactions followed by impression level features, which talk about what kind of device or what's the time of the day is. Now to improve your predictions, we need to learn like nonlinear transformations that can improve the understanding of the user. In this particular setup, these gradient boosted decision trees learn these nonlinear interactions. Once you learn these interactions, you can pass this information as a feature transformation combined with the logistic regression model. If you look at the kind of features that you can train, like gradient boosted decision trees are good with like small cardinality categorical features, good with numerical features, but they cannot handle features that have high vocabulary, something like advertiser ID or like ad group IDs in general. So the combination of GBDTs and logistic regression help to bring this power. In this particular setup, the GBDTs are learning nonlinear transformations, while logistic regression is learning very high level categorical features. In terms of ads, one thing that I want to note is like ads inventory keeps on changing. Like these models need to be keep retraining frequently because your ads inventory, unlike your organic content on the platform, is not static. And you need to be able to adhere to different user characteristics and advertiser characteristics. So here in this setup, the GBDD models, due to their inherent nature, cannot be retrained. They cannot be trained incrementally, but logistic regressions can be trained incrementally in general. So in this setup, one part of the model architecture is kept static. And one thing I want to highlight, this is the time frame around 2014 and 2017 where machine learning ecosystem was not that mature. During this time, Pinterest used to train this model in an Exiboost library, translate them into a TensorFlow library, and serve them through a different library in-house in C++ so that we can ensure that we have low latency serving. Over time, we see that this kind of like hybrid system in machine learning ecosystem slows down the growth. As you can imagine, based on the complexity of the different product size in general, you can see if you're training for one objective, singular models, these can explode in general. Over time, this led to like model explosion in the system. We had to maintain about 60 plus models at some, at some point. What that leads into in terms of the models is, now if you want to let's say add a new feature to your system, it takes longer time because this feature now needs to be added one after the other for each of your like models that you have in production. And more importantly, let's say if you want to remove some features from your system, like now that feature needs to remove from each of these models, which slows down developer velocity, increases complexity in general. Also, these GBT models are static, so they are not able to capture feature translations that are changing over time, and they are not responsive in general. In general, this leads to like suboptimal systems, systems that cannot be maintained and leading to poor performance. So this was the time, and I think these red boxes represent the relative wins that we see from each of these translations and transformations. So around this time, around 2017, like neural networks was the go-to choice of the networks in general for some of the benefits that neural network brings in. So during this time, Pinterest started investing in moving the stack from GBDTs to more neural network-based approaches. I think this is like some of what are the benefits of neural networks in comparison to different kind of different architecture. So one of the thing is like in terms of feature interactions, the GBT model can learn some nonlinear feature interactions. The neural network can also learn some nonlinear interactions. But in terms of different kind of features that you can input into neural networks, it's much more powerful than your GBTs and logistic regression stacks in general. In terms of like utilizing pre-trained embeddings or learning embeddings as part of the model architecture, which is a very powerful paradigm shift in recommendation models in general. So I'll go into some of the details about how this DNN model moves. So if you can imagine the first GBT model that we have, we replace that with a very simplistic machine learning perceptron-based model, and the same kind of setup with a hybrid model sustains in there in that particular sense. One thing I want to highlight, like in this kind of machine learning traditional world was like, 
feature engineering was always handcrafted. So if you have two different kinds of features, so manually, like based on intuition, you'll decide which features are useful to one another. And then you'll combine these features and do this handcrafted feature engineering. And these features then can pass through like multi-layer perceptrons in general. Over time, as the feature dimension keeps on growing, defining these features becomes a much harder task because now you don't know which features should be combined together and that slows down velocity. So one thing I still want to share here is that once we move to GBDT, the amount of wins that we see were much, much bigger. But as we move to the neural network-based approaches, based on expectation, the amount of wins that you see were much smaller in general. But over time, this laid down a solid foundation to bring the future iterations that we had planned. Now, between 2018 to 2020, Pinterest spent considerable amount of time in revamping its like in models in general and changing this methodology of how we train models and serve those models in general. So if you look, it spent around two years because we were working in a stack and we are also re-architecturing how the model works. And that leads to like significant amount of time to get it right. This is like Pinterest model that we call as AutoML, which is different than what the industry calls AutoML, but like there's a blog that I have linked here. But there are three characteristics of this model. One, instead of doing feature engineering by hand or letting the engineers do the feature engineering, this works on creating, being able to take raw inputs as feature. The feature engineering component is now handed over to the model in general. It can learn different feature interactions and summarization as part of the model architecture. And I'll go into some of the details about how that can be done in general through like some open source solutions that we have. And now these models, instead of training for one objective, they can train for multiple objectives. Now, one question is like why this can happen in neural networks, but cannot happen in like GBDTs or logistic regressions. Neural networks are very powerful, even with like theoretical analysis, like neural networks are like fun universal function approximators. They can look at history and try to predict the future. And in that component, they are much more powerful to able to ingest different modalities of features that traditional machine learning algorithms lack. So just to give a brief overview of what are the different components of the model in general, the first component is the representation layer. So if you, in neural networks, defining your future features and how you want to normalize the features play a very crucial role, unlike the GBDTs. So this layer is the interface between the feature interaction, like the raw features, and how they are used in the model. So first, very simple features like numerical features, you want to normalize them and you can use like clipping or like z-score normalization to understand how you want to send that to the model architecture. For categorical features, you can learn your embeddings or like vocabulary to decide what kind of embeddings that you want to learn for them. After that, they are also like in Pinterest, like when we started developing this model, one of the thing in the traditional machine learning world was that we want to learn two features together. So that's where our summarization layer was. The user could define what features need to be learned together explicitly as part of it. So something like a category vector for a user or a pin. These are very similar features. You can say, okay, I want to learn them together. Over time, they started to limit the growth of the features. They started to limit that users couldn't define what kind of features to be learned together. And over time, we started reducing this feature interaction or the summarization layer. Okay, I think the slides are getting truncated there, but yeah, I think the third one is around like, how do you now learn feature interactions as part of this model? And I'll go into some of the details about how those architectures work. And finally, it passed in through like fully connected layers and classical deep learning networks. Now, if you can imagine this model architecture that I showed before, if I go back in general, like this model architecture till the screen component is trying to learn what is a good feature interaction is. Once you learn a good feature interaction, you can multitask across different objectives because now you have a good understanding of your features. And now you can understand different objectives like click, good clicks, repins, which are very correlated to each other. So you don't need separate models to learn these interactions and just learn it as part of the network. There could also be different type of data sets in your system, which might not be learned together. So at this point in these networks, we also could split these networks apart so that you can learn some of the components together and don't learn some of the components in that perspective. Now, in terms of the next iterations that happened here was to improve this feature crossing and learn these feature interactions in general. And this is like one example that I show, like just improving these feature interactions, they could be as simple as utilizing a DCN Sorry, yeah. just an idea. Maybe if you come out of full screen, the full screen will be able to fit. But I think then recording might be an issue. Or oh, okay, okay. It should be okay. Never mind. Never mind. Should I make it bigger or? 
Okay, let me make this. Sorry. But now, should I? It's still getting. Is this okay? Or uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think now the next set of iterations that happened were to improve this feature crossing, and there are like multiple research around that. And I'll go into like intuition of one of that in general. So this is the DCN V2 module that comes from Google. It's called like deep and cross. I just wanted to give an intuition what this crossing means. So let's say if you have a feature which is like X0, X1, and X2, you want to learn feature interactions in general. As part of the model architecture, you're learning this weight matrix, which is W0 till W22. You're learning this like kind of another, like kind of another bias vector here, which is B0, B1, B2. And then concatenating, adding like ResNet site connections, which comes from like the computer vision domain when you're training deep models and doing an element-wise product. So let's see what it means in general and how multiplicative interactions can be learned as part of the model. So if you multiply those weight metrics with your feature vectors, you can see that you have this W0, X0, W0, one. So it's just learning a linear combination at this point. Then as the next step, you can add this bias vector that you have. So it's adding another additional value or additional dimension to your vector that you have. So the magic happens in this element-wise product in general. So if you look between these two slides, what changes, now you are doing X0 with W00 plus X0. And here in this second row, so like the first row, second column, you have X0 multiplied with a combination of X1. Similarly, you have X0 multiplied with X2. So it's trying to learn like multiplicative order, something between X0, 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 X1, X1, X2. And finally, you can also add like X1, X0, X1, X2 to that. So in general, this is now getting to a second order degree interaction that you're learning as part of your model architecture. Now these layers could be stacked on top of each other. Instead of having the X1, X2 that you have, you have something that you have learned previously, and you can then combine these to learn from second degree to like third degree interactions in general. Okay, but I might not get animation now, but that's fine. So I think, so if you look at in terms of translations, like from 2018 to 2020, most of the things went into developing the architecture. Now, once we have this solid architecture, how can we improve it to improve the performance? So the next set of iterations came in improving the features that feed into these models. And in terms of features, one of the most important features that go into the model is, can you featureize what the user is doing in the, on the platform and use that as a way to define what your next activity would be? That's something we call as like user journey modeling. So now if you take inspiration from the LLM domain, it's about like, if you see these words, what's the next probable word that you will have in the sentence? Very similar to that here, if you have this action that the user has done on the platform, what would be the next action, which is very same as what the recommendation models are trying to do. Now, how do you use this information of this journey in a latent space and utilize that to improve performance is the next set of iterations and wins that comes from. In, before we go there, go there, let's understand like how do we define a pin in this ecosystem? How do we define like what's a good representation of that image that we saw before? For that, Pinterest has a very like in-house development of embeddings like that translate these images based on their textual, visual, and the place in the graph that they have on the platform. If you're more interested, Pinterest has a published paper on that called as PinSage. But these embeddings are very central to understanding the user behavior on the platform. Now, what we can do if we have these embeddings is this part. Let's say if we have, like this user has different multiple touch points. Let's say they're interested in recipe pins or they're interested in like home decor or like travel pins. But depending on what pin we want to rank, let's say it's a recipe pin, not all of these pins are relevant in that context. So can we, instead of just, let's say, averaging out this representation, can we do better than that? And that's where the attention models come in general. So in this particular scenario, if you want to like featureize this particular sequence, you can like pay more attention to the, or pay more weightage to the embeddings for the first two pins. But let's say if you have another pin that is, you're trying to rank for let's say travel, in those cases, you can pay more attention to the pins that you have here in general. So I think one thing is like, at least till this point, Pinterest was invested in like still serving these models on CPU, even though we serve the, like train these models on GPUs, the serving setup is always like CPU serving. So now if you want to bring this into the production system, you want to make sure that the models are still low latency. To do that, there are multiple ways in that sequence that you can do. One is restricting that sequence to very small entities, like five or six activities that the user is doing. 
utilizing like pre-trained embeddings from an offline system so, don't, so that you don't need to learn these embeddings on the fly in general. You can have different ways to control the output of these embeddings so that you can control your network size. So now I think, I think in terms of transition, we went till the attention sequence. At this point, Pinterest was still doing that kind of a hybrid system where you train something in TensorFlow, you do that, and you then ingest it into a C++ system where you're trying to optimize for your serving latencies. Over time, as this architecture becomes more complicated, it becomes much harder to translate things across different languages. And at that time, Pinterest invested in like moving to native serving, where whatever you train is whatever you serve in general, so that you can avoid pitfalls of wrong translations. So having seen that sequence modeling adds value, the next set of improvements come in. How can we make this sequence even larger than what we have and make it more informative? So this is like very similar to like the way like the translations have happened in the natural language processing domain, but how do we bring those ideas back into the recommendation system? So transformers have become like the two-go models in general to understanding different kinds of sequences or user behavior. So in this particular setup, we wanted to increase the sequence beyond like five, six, what we have in the attention module to something like 100 plus sequence collected over like three months in the past for the user. Now, collecting these sequences, and you're still serving on CPU models, we cannot make these sequences much more complicated. In terms of embeddings, those embeddings that I shared before have some dimension of like 256 floating point numbers. So those are pretty heavy to serve in general. So in this particular architecture, we utilize very simple features like action type, which means like whether the user clicked on something or hide on something, but we don't know what that thing is. What was the time that this happened? So it's a singular value in general. And what's like some kind of characteristics which are limited and categorical, such as annotation types. One thing to show, like in this architecture with transformers, you can make the model more time aware. And having this understanding whether this action happened yesterday versus two months ago is changes the distribution and learning that the model can have. So over time till this point, we, we realized the power that having sequences help in general to understanding user activity and make it more responsive to the ecosystem. The next set of iterations come in, how can we make the sequence even more richer than the models that we have? Between this 2022, this diagram, I think we don't have animation here, but like between these two, Pinterest moved to like GPU serving so that we can serve even more complicated, bigger models through GPUs. So now in terms of combining different long-term sequences, like the sequences can go behind as much as you like. They can go about like two years in general. So now how do you serve these big sequences in general? So to serve these big sequences, there are like two parts of the network or the sequence that you can generate. Since some of the sequence is long-term, you can pre-compute this offline as part of your like a model training process. It can be computed, let's say for sequences beyond two days to let's say a year, they can be computed offline, indexed into your system, and are being represented by a singular value. For more real-time sequences, they can be trained as part of the model architecture, and they can be inferred more quickly in general. So splitting the model into two components, one which is offline generated versus something that's online generated, helps to power these sequences. So now, like this is some of the translation, and I think I'll go into a bit detail about, like very briefly about some of the architectural changes that we have in the ecosystem. But like at this point, Pinterest was still iterating with like TensorFlow models, now serving in TensorFlow, moving GPU in general. But now one thing that I want to highlight is like doing machine learning at scale is very complicated. It's like just changing these architectures would not be very easy if you don't have an ecosystem to do that. Like in terms of writing like these architectural changes, it's just this small piece in the middle, that's the ML code that you're writing. But to bring that into like bring that into like production systems, every part of the ML ecosystem or ML ops needs to improve to cater to that. Over time, like investments around how you collect the data, how do you make sure your data is correct? How is that data being passed into machine learning models? How do you validate them? Manage your resources better. How do you serve them? Each of them needs to come in together to make this happen. Over time, Pinterest spent considerable amount of time to make this set of this set of infrastructure much better in general, so that you can iterate faster. And that can be a discussion of another day. But before I close, I want to share that like how I think Pinterest has a blog if you're interested that is linked here. But like how machine learning is done today in general. Over time, Pinterest unified its machine learning based infrastructure based on PyTorch. We moved from TensorFlow to PyTorch last year based on some of the reasonings and how we see the industries evolving in general. And now 
in terms of machine learning platform, we created very standard like CI, CD, Docker image-based solutions where you can easily create plug and play kind of technologies between different parts of your ecosystem. And learning from all the lessons that we have over time, we could create an ecosystem that works best for all the use cases. And today about 95% of the jobs have already migrated to this kind of ecosystem. And yeah, if you're interested, feel free to check out the blog that's linked here. But yeah, I just want to take a time to acknowledge the work of different teams that went behind to create this best experience for the users on the platform. And thank you, I can open for questions. Anyone has any questions for Ayush? Please raise your hand. There you go. Thank you for the presentation. Um, okay. Is there anywhere we can find this PowerPoint online or will it be shared afterwards? This is yeah, I am free to share. Yeah, I think depending on where I can share, please, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, we will be sharing the recording and presentations uh, in a week. We will either email, we'll email and share it on our Slack page as well. Um, any other questions for Ayush? Excuse me. Oh, yeah. uh, just a quick question. Do you uh, deploy the model in your in-house cluster or like on public clouds like AWS? I think Pinterest has been pretty much into machine learning since 2014. So we have invested in an in-house solution for a long time and we are still using our in-house solution today. Right, thanks. Uh, hey, that's right. Make sure that we're not talking over each other. Uh, you shared uh, a model before. It had like multiple objectives at one time. Yep. I'm not sure if that's the latest architecture on how you guys are doing it. But um, let's say you have like a click and other kind of actions you're 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 training at the same time. How do you uh, pick the right the model when there's a trade-off between kind of the metrics that are coming out for those multiple objectives? Yeah. So I think that's a very good question. I think there are two ways that we make the decision there. Sometimes like very correlated tasks like which go very well together in general, like CTRs, good clicks, like relevance and like saves. Like they have, we have seen they almost go together in the same direction. But for some of the tasks, let's say like you're learning for conversion prediction, which might not go that directly with clicks in general. So in that sense, we need the click predictions to supplement our training in general because they are denser signals. In those decisions, we split the models so that we can have two separate models where these extra tasks are only auxiliary tasks in general based on business needs. So at that point, we make this decision to split the model and not split based on how much value it brings to the, like, the business in general. But I can say today the models are split just between conversion prediction and CTI, like all the on-site actions that we have. The in, okay. in the attention model architecture that you showed, the inputs you said to keep the latency down are just a simple, like did they click on it or not click on it and not the actual image features. So yeah. So I would say these these are actual embeddings that we have for the pins. And we only keep pins that are relevant, something like pins that were saved in general on the platform. We see that saved pins are more relevant. So this sequence is only from the pins that you have saved on the platform, or it could have pins that you have clicked or spent some considerable amount of time on those pins in general. But they do also have like the features for that particular pin. So, so in this, we are using embeddings as features, which are like more dense content-based embeddings that we have. We have also tried with simpler features. So I think the only issue with simpler features is those features are less powerful. So if you don't have simpler features, then probably like if you don't have embeddings, then simpler features would add value. But in Pinterest ecosystem, those embeddings were generated even much long before in general, like 2018s, 2019s. Pinterest has those embeddings. So since they were already there, we can use them more effectively. Oh, makes sense. Thanks. But in this architecture, this transformer on CPU, we are using simpler features in general, just because of the serving latencies that we have. Yeah, so I had question yeah. based on that. So let's say these five, yeah. if you don't have the image features, then are they that helpful? So I think what we have is this annotation feature, which is trying to say something like whether this pin is from home decor versus it's okay. from recipe or let's say from food, food domain in general. So it's making that distinction at this point. So it's like a categorical embedding rather than like the image. Pre-trained embeddings, okay. yeah. Got it. Thanks. So uh, I want to know, um, 
Can you? Oh. How often do you do the training for offline models and online models? And how do you make those decisions? So I think for all of these prediction models, they are being trained every hour in general. So we have checks in our pipeline to make sure that we don't train, like we don't push something that's bad, but all of these are being trained like every hour in general. Uh, all the models? Like all of these like ranking models are trained every hour. For some of these embedding based models that are trying to give you what these embeddings are, they are not trained that frequently because there is a shift, like there could be a concept shift in those embeddings, which might break your downstream system. So that's a problem that we're trying to adhere to. But all of the online models are being trained incrementally, frequently. Could you tell more about why you switched from TensorFlow to PyTorch? So I think there are multiple decisions or like reasons why I made the switch. The first one was Pinterest had more active PyTorch community around that time than TensorFlow, but also in the industry, and in terms of PyTorch adoption in academia, we are seeing that PyTorch is getting more adopted. The third one was like many of the things that we needed, like distributed training, like serving in GPU, like mixed precision training, came out of the box in the PyTorch ecosystem. In TensorFlow ecosystem, they are not very well supported in general. So all of those, I think, and also I think PyTorch is more iterative in general, easier to develop than like, Pinterest was in TensorFlow 1 in general when we made this decision. Like you're we using TensorFlow 1. So the decision was to move to TensorFlow 2 versus moving to PyTorch. In that ecosystem, both of these translations looked equally the same because TensorFlow 1 to TensorFlow 2 was not a very easy migration in general. So that made also that decision to move to PyTorch directly. All right, we have one more question. Um, and I think um, you have it. Please go ahead. Thank you for sharing your presentation and showing the background, how the model's been trained and how the background being produced. I'm, I'm really curious, uh, being as one of the customers of Pinned Interest, assuming that the models work as you presented, how that those newly trained models will affect the end consumers? So today we saw the new possibility, how Pinterest can evolve in the future as a business, how that would affect the end consumers, what the end consumers would get out of that new developed models. So I think that's a very good question. And like, I think. How the end consumers, consumers today from Pinterest would benefit from the newly developed models as what being presented today? Yeah, I think over time, like as these models are becoming better, we want to understand each of the individual personalization better, like what is relevant to that user. So these models are trying to understand the personalization for each of the user. But now how do you measure that success? Like Pinterest utilizes typical AB experiments to understand whether this model is adding value to the user segment that we have shown based on some key business metrics that we have, which I might not be able to share here, but like based on the metrics that we think are correlated with the business growth, Pinterest makes those decisions whether we want to use these models for all the users or not, or not, not use that in that particular sense. Thank you. Awesome. All right, thank you, Ayush. Thank you to the audience for asking questions. Thank you for joining. If you have more questions for Ayush, you can find him towards the end of the meetup. And next up speaker, we have uh, Roman Claret from Netflix. Oh, well. All right. Um, 
try to remember what I had in my notes. Um, okay, hi, my name is, I'm oh, sorry. Where's the first slide? Okay, it's the first slide. All right, they're mostly not too cut, but anyway. Um, hi, my name is Roman. Um, I'm from Netflix. Uh, I'm going to talk about something completely different. So lower, not models, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so show of hands, who's heard of Metaflow? Not the embalming fluid. It actually is an embalming fluid as well, but no? OK, good. So this presentation won't be completely boring. Um, OK, so uh, ML systems, this is a fairly famous slide. Let me see if I can get rid of this thing. OK, there we go. Uh, this is a, fav fav uh, a, a pretty famous slide that basically says that to build an ML system, basically the part that uh, data scientists are interested in is that little tiny box in the center. And uh, there's all this other stuff around it that's not so much fun for data scientists, a lot more fun for infrastructure people like me. Uh, so what Metaflow tries to do is uh, to basically abstract away a bunch of this, these bigger boxes and lets the data scientists focus more of their time on the small box and basically um, you know, at the end of the day, contribute more value to the company because that's what they're paid to do and not deal with this other crap. All right. Oop. The other thing Metaflow tries to help you do is um, a lot of the process in data science is very iterative. So you go from a prototype, you know, you start on a workbook or a notebook, sorry, then you create something, then, you know, you might try to scale it and then, you know, you'll try to figure out how you get your data more quickly, et cetera. And then you do an A-B test and you go back and you basically kind of like do this loop for a while. Um, Metaflow tries to make it uh, faster to go around this loop so that again, you can produce more value for the company uh, more quickly. So to build an ML system, uh, as we've seen, you need all this stuff in the stack. Uh, so it goes from the top, uh, model development, which is where basically, okay, I'm really having trouble with this thing. Um, the data scientists pretty much care at the about the top. They care about doing the model development, feature engineering. The bottom part, not so much. They just kind of want it to work. Uh, on my end, uh, the infrastructure part, uh, the bottom is more important and where we want to be uh, more opinionated. Metaflow tries to basically leave the data scientists free to do what they want at the top of the stack and be more opinionated about the bottom part of the stack, so about the parts that they don't care about as much. We're going through these layers kind of um, one at a time. So before that, um, no need to reinvent the wheels. Uh, there's a bunch of system out there that exist already that solve a lot of these things. You might have heard of some of these names, Airflow, for example, and Argo or Schedulers, AWS. Uh, it's missing its smile, but it's there. Um, is uh, Well, everyone knows what AWS. It does storage, for example, uh, Kubernetes. I don't need to introduce it, Spark, et cetera. So Metaflow doesn't try to basically redo this. It just kind of sits on top and uses these tools so that data scientists on top can um, leverage these tools more easily. So going through some of the levels in the stack um, that I showed previously one by one. So from a data warehouse point of view, um, oh, I should say uh, everything that's in this slide is actually open source, um, except a few things that are called out with little asterisks like fast data right here. So uh, in um, open source Metaflow, you can use AWS S3 as well as um, GCS or, and um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, they might have support for Azure actually too. Uh, internally at Netflix, we also have something called fast data, which allows you to access Hive and Iceberg tables and write to Iceberg tables uh, directly from your Python code and do a bunch of in-memory uh, operations. But that part is not open source. But data warehouse, basically, that's the part that um, Metaflow can help you with there. Compute resources. In open source, you have AWS Batch, and you have Kubernetes. Uh, internally, we have something called Titus, which is very similar to Kubernetes. It just basically came out at the same time as Kubernetes and Kubernetes 1. Uh, but internally, we still use that. Uh, it works pretty much the same way. Job scheduler, um, Airflow, Step Functions, and Argo are the ones that are available in open source. So you can basically integrate with um, those types of schedulers. Internally, we have something called Maestro. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, there's a blog on it as well about um, what they did to build this scheduler. We had a previous iteration of it, which wasn't scalable enough. And this one is very, very nice, uh, I have to say. Um, from an architecture point of view, uh, this kind of shows, and I'll go in more details in the next uh, couple of slides about how you build your project with Metaflow. 
But here I'm just trying to show that you can kind of annotate your code to do like A-B experiments, for example. You can give it a name of a project. You can have different branches when you launch it, so different experiments that you're launching around. So this kind of helps you uh, architect your experiment um, fairly easily. Uh, model operations, uh, Metaflow comes with a UI where you can kind of see what's happening if you click, well, this is not clickable, but if you click on uh, each of the tasks, you would be, see the logs of the task. You could also see the data that it's produced uh, and things like that. Uh, internally, we also have a hosting solution that allows you to, once you have trained your model to deploy it and allow people to actually use it. Um, um, in open source, there is no integrated hosting solutions. You can find a couple based on Selden, for example, that uh, are int integrated, uh, but I'm not talking about that too much in this talk. Uh, all right, so we've done all the boring parts, or rather the data scientist now uh, has hopefully Metaflow taking care of all the boring parts. So you're kind of ready to take off if you notice there was a plane being built at the bottom of the slide, or maybe it got cut off, I don't know, was it? Oh yeah, there it is, but okay. Um, so you're ready to take off. So how do you actually program something with Metaflow to actually solve a data science problem? So um, at a very basic level, Metaflow just has things called steps, which take some form of input, they do some form of computation, and they produce some form of output. Pretty straightforward. Um, so everything is built around that. Um, and we build this in a DAG form, so a directed acyclic graph. Uh, here's the simple one. You start at the start. All Metaflow starts at start, and they all end at end. Pretty straightforward. Here you have a, a branch where you execute A and B kind of uh, at the same time, or you could execute them at the same time. They don't depend on each other. Then you have the step, join step, where you kind of uh, get the results of A and B together, and then um, your end step. Um, and you would write something that looks uh, like on the on the left or on my left, on your right. Um, that looks like this. This is the, you know, kind of a functional uh, do nothing, hello world uh, Metaflow uh, flow. Uh, you just kind of decorate your functions with this little at step, and then you tell it where it goes next um, from the from the step. Um, so it's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of how you um, write your your flow. Um, Importantly in Metaflow, each of these little boxes is actually a separate process. Uh, and this has a lot of interesting ramifications. This means that you can run this on your local box and it runs just fine. And then you can also run it on Kubernetes and it runs exactly the same way because each of these things are effectively running independently in some sense. Um, it also has other nice characteristics that each step is naturally checkpointable. You can basically like it can run and then if it fails after a particular step, you could uh, resume your whole execution by taking the results of all the previous steps that have run and just continue where you, you failed. So there's lots of nice uh, features um, that come from the fact that each of these uh, steps runs as a process. In terms of terminology, you see some of it here. Um, Metaflows are called flows, like these programs. Are, there's a flow uh, inside. Um, each time a flow runs, it's called a run. So one execution of this whole uh, graph would be a run inside each run, you have several steps. Here you have the start, the A, B, and, and the join. And each uh, execution of these steps uh, is a task. And uh, right here, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the task and a step, but that's not always the case, as I'll show later. So um, how does data move from all this here? Ideally, you would want things that you produce in your start step to be visible in your A and B step, and et cetera, et cetera, and without having to worry about it, because it's kind of uh, difficult particularly for running in a distributed setting. So uh, here we just say that, you know, we're setting X equals zero at the beginning. Uh, these branches are adding two and three, and then the join step takes the maximum value and propagates it to the end. Uh, nothing very fancy, just to show how the data flows. Um, this code here is not actually what you would write. This is what Metaflow does under the hood. It's just to show the principle of what's happening. You just write self.x equals zero, and then self.x plus equals three, that's it. Um, everything else happens under the hood. So here when um, start finishes, Metaflow will say, oh, there's a variable called X that I need to store somewhere and it's gonna store it in S3. It's gonna hash the content of zero and then store it at that address saying, okay, at this address here, I have this content zero. Uh, and then it's going to map it saying, X is A4, A, B, B6, something like that. Then um, when A needs to load X, here to add three to it is going to look, okay, my parent was start, where was, um, what does X correspond to? And it goes to S3, fetches this uh, artifact, 
loads it into A, adds three, and then it stores it back up out again the next time. So at the end of your flow, you kind of get something like this, where you have these different addresses, and then the correspondence that Metaflow keeps, like X first corresponds to this address, and A corresponds to a different address, and B corresponds to the, another address. And then the join step, it'll correspond to the maximum of that, which is effectively the one that corresponds to uh, the value in, that came from A. Um, so that's how um, data moves uh, through Metaflow. And uh, the, you, the programmer, or you, the data scientist, uh, don't have to worry at all about this. You just basically write this using self dot, but very natural Python uh, expression, and the data will naturally flow uh, through your flow. Uh, the other thing that the Metaflow allows you to do really simply is uh, I want more resources. This is something that's pretty common. I want to move from my laptop to move to a bigger uh, GPU box. And uh, all you have to do in Metaflow is add this little uh, decorator here that I highlighted in red saying I want uh, 16 CPUs and one GPU. Uh, you also clearly need to have at least access to a resource that has GPU and 16 CPUs. But if you do, uh, like if you're running on AWS, uh, then this will effectively work exactly the same way. There's nothing else that you need to do. You just basically annotate it this way saying go, and it will uh, take care of it for you, uh, giving you the resources that you need to do your training step. And then the other step you can say, well, now I don't need a GPU anymore, but I need to do some massive uh, memory operation. So you can just ask for more memory, do that and move from there. So this makes it very easy, again, from the initial um, point of moving from um, a prototype to production, you start writing this on your laptop, you start executing it on your laptop, and then you just annotate it to say, okay, this step now needs to run um, on the cloud because then you have, I need more resources, and it just runs the same way. The last thing uh, I wanted to bring out here is uh, versioning. Um, this allows you to kind of collaborate. So Alice and Bob, I know we're not in cryptography, but it works the same way. Um, you can basically, um, scope, Alice can do her own work, Bob can do his work. You can also then share them uh, by basically tagging them. For example, here, uh, Alice has a unsampled model, Bob has a sampled model. And then if you wanna get the sampled model, you'd be able to just say, okay, give me the sampled models for this. So this kind of allows you to uh, organize your, your different runs and have different people collaborate on the same um, problem without colliding with each other. All right, so um, any questions till now? Sorry, I speak a little fast. Yes. Um, on the data movement, you mentioned about the variables being stored on an S3, but what about data that is streaming in or data that is pulled from external sources like another database, which is being transferred from step A to step B and others? Are those also being pushed to S3 buckets? It's a good question, and um, you can do both. And I, obviously, I'll tell you that if you're trying to store an artifacts like several gigabytes off of the table, it might not be the best of ideas. Uh, but technically, it's possible. Um, what you would probably do and what people do end up doing is that uh, the data itself lives in Hive or Iceberg or somewhere else, and you might store a reference to the table or the partition that you're reading uh, from your uh, in your step and pass that down. And uh, Metaflow does provide um, a fast S3 client, for example, and, and uh, that allows you to load these, the data back into the step quickly from directly the Hive table or the Iceberg table. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so uh, we take, took care of the infrastructure. Uh, we took care of our code. Uh, things are good. We're cruising at a nice altitude. Uh, life is sweet uh, and sleeping at home and producing value for the company until no, it doesn't. Uh, okay, so these are actual examples of what happened. And yes, they're slightly contrived, or I just picked a few that I found uh, on our Slack threads, but they're actually, it, it, they, they, they did happen. So, um, you know, uh, here we go. We're seeing uh, error in Metaflow hosting. So uh, Metaflow hosting uh, is the stuff I told you about that we do the uh, hosting stuff that's not an open source. You can replace Metaflow hosting by just Metaflow it comes up the same thing. Uh, it has this problem and this is the problem, um, you know. Okay, fine. Uh, and then another one, I had a job fail last night. It was working, presumably, and all of a sudden it stopped working. Why? Well, I, we don't really know. Uh, this is the message from the user. Or another one, uh, I'm running into issues loading artifacts where Pandas 2.0, uh, SciComp is our development machine, can't unpickle data frame created for Pandas 1.0. 
Pandas is terrible at backwards compatibility. Don't even get me started. Um, but anyway, these problems, why do they occur? Um, you thought you had taken care of everything. You being the good data scientist have pinned all your requirements. You have installed everything properly and it doesn't work anymore. Um, why is that? Well, a um, couple of reasons. The world keeps changing. Uh, in the case of the one on the lower left over here, the PyMC, uh, I believe that JAX or some library released an update that was incompatible with another library that was being used. And that other library just had two days delay to get updated and broke. Um, so the world keeps changing. Uh, we see a lot of this, uh, os.system pip install. Okay, fine. Some developers do slightly better by like doing sub process, but still bad, terrible, terrible idea for lots of reasons. <laughs> Uh, but so when you do this, uh, you're basically putting yourself at the mercy of whatever the world has changed, uh, and uh, you're pulling in the new packages. And even if you say, well, I'm going to pull in just this version of the package, well, this version of the package is going to pull in other packages that might pull in other packages, and one of them will have broken. Um, dependency management is not fun, and it's not something the data scientists want to think about. Um, it affects productionized flows, like basically your flow has been running on Argo or on Airflow for a while, and all of a sudden it stops working because the world has changed. Uh, it affects reproducing your experiments. So if two months later you want to come and say, hey, I remember I trained this model. It worked great. Uh, I want to go back to it. Well, tough luck. Uh, most likely you won't be able to do that. Uh, and it also affects accessing past results. So kind of similar to reproducing the experiments if you want to figure out uh, what you produced in the past. Uh, again, um, tough luck, usually, uh, unless you're really careful. So, um, well, I had to do this. Uh, I'm not supposed to repeat what it says here, but I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the movie. So what do we need? We need uh, to persist the flow and the code, and as well as everything, all the environment that the flow depends on to actually operate. Um, the reason for snakes is because we picked the solution called Conda. And there's a whole slew of snakes in that solution. Uh, Conda, Mamba, and Rattler are the three big ones. There's also Boa, I think, for something slightly different. Why did we pick that one? There was a couple of options that we kind of looked at. First of all, the first one is, uh, well, the Python package index, uh, so pip, that everyone kind of loves and knows. And it works great, except doesn't really provide good runtime isolation. You have to use the Python that's installed. It's not language agnostic, so it's not so great. And for certain things where people need other packages from other languages, it does have a great low overhead. Uh, it's also not always accurate in resolving your environments. Uh, Docker is the usual you know, um, best solution to provide runtime isolation, and it does a great job doing that. It's definitely language agnostic. Uh, low overhead, not so much. It's a little expensive to use. Uh, also, in our particular case, um, our data scientists run in the cloud, so they run in a Docker container, which makes Docker kind of a no-go. Well, things have changed a little bit, but still, mostly, it's really hard to use Docker within dark Docker unless you really want to move around uh, mountains. So Conda was kind of a nice middle ground. It provides good runtime isolation. It's language agnostic. It has a fairly low overhead. We started thinking it had a low overhead. It turned out it has a slightly higher overhead than anticipated, but still lower than a Docker um, overhead. So we went with this um, solution. So something based on the Conda environment. Um, and we designed it in a way so that it's fully self-contained. Um, one thing you may have noticed, the first error that I had was uh, something to do with, uh, I can't install a package. It turns out that mirrors like PyPy, uh, and we have our own internal mirror at Netflix, can go down, or they can throttle you, or they have a lot of variety of other things that may block you from actually accessing the package. And if you're doing this OS system pip install that I talked about earlier in a very large uh, setting, so for example, Metaflow allows you to branch out in a what we call a 4-H node, so you can like say, for example, uh, I want to, I don't know, worst case scenario, I want to run this model on every single meta, uh, Netflix user, which is about 200 million. So you're spinning up 200 million containers to um, run the stuff. And all of those are doing pip installs. Uh, not great for the, the, the backing um, um, mirror. So we wanted to be fully self-contained so we didn't depend on these external systems uh, to pull in your packages. Uh, we wanted it to be easy, easy to use. So intuitive to data scientists, um, Metaflow-y in some sense. So they liked using Metaflow, we wanted to provide the same kind of capabilities uh, for um, dependency management. 
We wanted it to be collaborative so that people could share environments. So if they basically were developing flows together, they would provide one environment that they could all use in all of their flows. And we wanted to enable debugability, uh, reproducibility, and extendability. And I'll go over all three um, in the next couple of minutes. So this is what it looks like. Uh, at the end of the day. Um, so we went with the little decorators because uh, Metaflow loves decorators. Um, and uh, you basically specify, for example, here you're installing PyTorch. Um, this is taken basically straight out of the PyTorch website. Uh, if you go there and says, I want to install PyTorch 2.1 for Conda, they tell you this is how you need to install it. You need to install PyTorch, PyTorch CUDA, and you need to add another channel called NVIDIA so they can pull in their CUDA drivers from there. Um, and then you can also have a company specific package that might not be in the Conda environment, but is in the PyPy kind of environment, so in your own mirror. So you can say, I want company lib. Here you can see that what this does is that step start will effectively have access to both PyTorch and company lib, and step end will just have access to PyTorch. You can kind of mix and match your environments like this, uh, and it's very easy for you to define them. Um, and once this is defined, uh, we guarantee that it will not change. Uh, once your flow starts running with this, uh, this environment will be uh, cached somewhere. I'll explain where. And uh, every time this flow runs, it will use the exact same environment unless you explicitly want to change it. Um, all right. So that's what it looks like. So very easy to use. Um, what is an environment? Uh, before we go a little bit further, uh, at the input is effectively the user requirement. So that's basically the stuff in red. So what the user wants is PyTorch and this company lib. Uh, what the environment actually becomes is this set of locked dependencies that says, well, for PyTorch, you need to install all these other packages, for company lib, all these other packages, and these are the exact versions that I want. Effectively, it's a lock file for those that are familiar with lock files. Um, that's what the output of an environment is. Uh, and it also contains all the locations for all the packages and libraries. Remember I said I didn't want to depend on um, things like mirrors, so where they are, and so we cache them. And then optionally, it uh, has an alias, a name, a reference. This is to enable sharing. I'll explain how that works. So if I'm a, just one slide of technical detail, um, because I find this cool. Uh, so at the beginning, you have environments. So these are effectively all the environments that are in your flow. Uh, if you, in the previous flow, we had two environments, one that for the start step that included both PyTorch and the company library, and then one for the end step that just included PyTorch. So for a flow, you gather all the environments that you need to actually resolve. Um, some of them you may have already resolved. So they might be known to you already. So from this, you extract the ones that are unknown, so the ones that you need to actually resolve. Then in parallel, we're going to run um, Conda, Pip, Poetry, some combination of it, depending on exactly the type of environment that you're giving to us. If it's just pure Conda, we'll just run Conda. If it's uh, something that's mixed of both Conda and um, PyPy packages, we'll run something called Poetry. And if it's just PyPy packages, we'll run PIP. After that, you basically, this resolution step gives you this lock file that I was mentioning earlier. So from the input that you have, this is the output effectively. These are all the packages that need to be saved somewhere and uh, to use to recreate your environment. So then we're going to save all these new packages to S3. So the ones that we don't know about, we'll fetch them once at this point. So from the mirror uh, or from wherever we need to fetch them, and then we'll push them to S3. This is done in a lazy fashion. So we only push to S3 the packages that we don't know about. And importantly, we only fetch them once at this point. After this, the packages will be in S3. They'll never be fetched from the web ever again. Uh, oops, sorry. And then last step is that basically these resolved environments, so basically the inputs from the user, the packages, as well as the locations into S3 are put back into the known solves. And they're also put into S3 so that other people can refer to them. So that's pretty much a very high level what happens uh, when we uh, save environments. So now what do we have? Um, okay, so uh, Metaflow already saved the code in the working directory as a package to S3 when you're running. And so now we have the execution environment. So now you have everything that you need to recreate, to continue running uh, your code all the time. Okay, so what we talked about here is that basically once we have all this pushed to S3. Every time the uh, every time a flow runs, it has a reproducible environment. It can run with uh, the code. It can run with the environment, and so you won't have 5 a.m. breakages uh, randomly. But can you reproduce your work later? Like, can someone use my model and get the same result? So this is reproducibility, and I define it as 
obtaining consistent uh, results across repeated trials. So reproducibility, it's kind of a spectrum from all the way not reproducible to the holy grail. What do you need to actually be able to reproduce someone else's results? Well, usually you probably need to start with the model, uh, at least have the model that you want to actually reproduce. This in Metaflow can be stored as a Metaflow artifact in the self dot something that is basically a persisted to S3, but that's usually not enough. Once you have the model, you probably can't do much with it unless you, uh, unless you have the code that goes with it. Ugh. Okay, I don't know what's happening with my mouse. Anyway, uh, you have the code that goes with it, which is the package that I talked about, the version control, like which model you're talking about, that's the Metaflow run. The metadata, which can be the artifact, which is more artifact, and basically all the libraries that we talked about just now. Once you have all this, you're in pretty good shape to be able to use the model that the user uh, trained in the first place. Uh, you probably also need data. Um, I did mention that Metaflow uh, doesn't necessarily track all your data in the sense that if it's coming from a, a Hive table, we're not going to necessarily store it. But we've realized that uh, most data scientists use good hygiene and tables are usually considered immutable. Uh, so once the data is in there, it'll usually always be in there. So you can refer to it uh, much further down the line. Uh, the last thing is uh, entropy. You know, If things happen, there's a bunch of randomness in some of these codes. Uh, that we don't really do anything with. So um, we enable reproducibility all the way to basically the data level. So we'll package your model or we'll save your model. We'll package your code. We have a good version control so you can figure out which one it, it did what. Metadata is up to you, whatever you want, and we can save it as well. And we save all the environments and we allow you to basically um, refer to data. And if you practice good data hygiene, uh, you'll be able to uh, use it easily. OK, um, in action, what does this look like? Well, the user just needs to do something like this, Metaflow environment create uh, from my flow one, two, three train step. Uh, this, what it does is downloads the code, working directory from S3, it downloads the environments from S3, and instantiates a local environment. Uh, you can do it cross-platform, it does work. Um, and it injects optionally a Jupyter notebook, so you can actually do this in your Jupyter uh, notebook as well. So this is uh, pretty useful. Um, Talk about sharing environments. Um, this is all you need to do if you want to share an environment. You resolve it, something like this. I didn't talk about this too much. You can specify environment in effectively a YAML file as well instead of in the code. Both ways work. Um, <clears throat> and when you do this, you basically give the environment a name, uh, PyTorch2, for example. And then in your code, you can just say, hey, I want to use the environment called PyTorch2. And that's pretty much it. Uh, notice here as well that you can actually extend your environment. I mentioned extendability. So in the start step here, what will happen is it'll use PyTorch2 as a base environment and it'll inject into it company lib. So in start, it will have company lib and PyTorch2 and versus end, it'll just have the PyTorch2 environment. Um, last use case uh, that uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, I did not plan for this when I uh, designed this in the first place, uh, but someone wanted to do basically uh, model explainability Basically, let's say calculate Shapley values. Uh, what they did is they had a bunch of models that were training, and all of those models, once they finished training, she wanted them to trigger this uh, flow that would explain her model or their models. Um, the problem is that each of the models had different uh, dependencies or different sets of uh, dependencies that uh, they needed to run. And she needed um, other dependencies, like the Shap library, for example, to actually explain the model. So this was a bit of a problem, like how do you solve this? Because I don't want to necessarily deploy a bunch of explainer flows, one for each model, because it's a lot of work and it's not really scalable. So we came up with this solution. As soon as my mouse decides to click, all right, well, all right. This, uh, so basically in the start step, uh, you get, so this is triggered. So when you're triggered, you get the information about the model that, you, that did the triggering. So assume that you can get the model dependencies somehow that way. Um, you basically calculate a new set of dependencies saying, okay, whatever the dependencies for that model were, I want those, plus I want to add my own. So in this case, like SHAP, for example. And then you just resolve the environment at that point. So basically you do what, what we had been describing about how you resolve environments when you start a flow. You resolve it at that point, you give it a new name, 
that's based on your run in this case. And then you, in your next step, you say, okay, now I want to use that environment that I just created. And um, this was actually a pattern I had not thought about. We actually added that fetch at exec argument just for this, but it was a fairly natural fit into the whole system. So the fetch at exec here basically tells it that this environment that I'm telling you about, I don't want you to resolve it when I'm deploying the flow. I want you to resolve it when I'm executing. It does kind of break the reproducibility notion that we had initially because now every time it runs, a new environment can be, can be used. But in this particular case, that was the behavior that was uh, needed. All right, one more thing. Uh, it's not the iPhone X, but um, in some cases, we have like a service that needs their client that uh, depends on an external service. In our case, uh, this is, um, for example, something to access our, our data warehouse. So if you version this client into your Metaflow in, uh, Conda environment so that it doesn't change, you can have issues because in some cases, the client and the service needs to be, need to be kept in sync. And this was a problem because we just said this whole talk here that I wanted my environment not to change. Um, but in some cases, you actually have no choice than to change the environment because your external service that you depend on has also changed. So we're like, okay, how can we solve this problem? Because this is not great. We still want this con environment. We don't want to put the service client inside the con environment because then it'll break. Uh, but we don't want to also not have a con environment because then otherwise the rest of the stuff will break. Um, so we came up with this solution, uh, which is the an escape hatch and it's a fancy RPC kind of server. Uh, what happens is in the con environment, um, something, the escape hatch, is masquerading as this module that you actually don't want to vendor or to, to put inside your environment. And it will spawn uh, environment of uh, another Python environment outside the Conda environment. So in the base environment, for example, so um, the, our, our, our data platform provides a Docker image that we all run in. It will spawn it into this uh, Docker image uh, and basically pretend to be this module. So everything that's in the Conda environment will access this module and actually all the code will be executed in the outside environment. Uh, and so we use this, for example, to access our uh, data warehouse. Uh, and it's been working pretty well, uh, mostly. All right, uh, and I'm done now, mostly on time. Uh, a few resources. Uh, everything I talked about is open source, uh, like I mentioned. Um, for a lot of it, you do need uh, the extensions, or the Metaflow Netflix extensions. Metaflow, the open source version, has PyPy and Conda decorators. It doesn't have all the functionality that I uh, described. Uh, you just need to install these two packages, and you'll basically get that. Uh, I hang out on Slack. I'm Roman. I think I'm the only one on Slack named Roman on that one. Uh, docs, and then uh, if you are interested in a managed version of Metaflow, uh, the folks at Outer Bounds, uh, basically spun out of Netflix, uh, provide a platform uh, that you that they will set up for you, and you don't have to do anything. So it's pretty cool. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, questions for Roman? I know you have. Go ahead. Thank you, Roman. Looking at your system design, looking at the one of the. Oh, uh, flows, how you're fitting the model, and you're starting from the point of gathering the inputs from the um, from the customers, users. I wonder, as uh, I'm highly aware of the infrastructure, how networks is run, and what is the data storage you're using to implement from the starting point? Where are you storing your customers' inputs to help your model to be executed in the most efficient way? Are you asking like where like user data is stored? No, so you started your model. If you can return a couple of slides oh, back. Sure, plug back in. I wonder, so as a lot of enterprises today that operate, there is no and never one united source of truth. And yes. Yes, so I, I wonder how you figure out at Netflix to bring all this data in one cohesive way to, to feed this model to predict the um, end results? I think I understand your question. Um, so Metaflow itself doesn't necessarily like help with that. It's, it's up to the data scientists. So like um, there's a lot of ML, there's a lot of types of ML at Netflix. Uh, some of them are like for business purposes. Some of them are for the recommender systems, for example. Um, and so each of those systems will have their own types of data sources. 
typically a lot of the data does end up in some sort of table, uh, usually, at least for the traditional data. There's you know, new forms of ML that may have non-traditional, non-tabular data. Um, but for most, tab for, for most data, they do end up in tables and different uh, parts of the company basically maintain different tables that uh, other systems will feed into. So like for the recommender systems, um, you know, the interaction for the users, there's a, a bunch of uh, processes that happen. And at the end of the day, the data gets dumped into tables. For business processes, uh, things like, for example, figuring out what movies we should be making, what actors uh, we should be hiring and stuff like that, uh, that data is uh, sourced from different uh, information and ends up in, in different tables. But basically that's up to the data scientists to, to figure out. So we don't, we don't figure out that. Do you believe in solutions that all this can be united using the right data modeling? <laughs> Bring yeah, the that, right AI that's not a question for me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I can't say that our data warehouse is a simple thing. Uh, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Ah, there you go. Uh, Ashraya, one sec. After this. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, do you support uh, dynamic structures, the uh, dynamic steps? Can you add like steps dynamically? And do you support uh, control structures like ifs, loops? Uh, if you want to repeat number of steps, like uh, and you don't know number uh, number of repeats in advance. Yes, so uh, it's a good question. Um, so the only dynamism that we support, and I actually didn't show it here, is uh, the dynamic for each in some sense. So like you can have a dynamic number of um, steps in a kind of a, a branching structure. Uh, it does not support loops. Um, this is something that we've kind of gone back and forth around. Most of the time, uh, people haven't needed them. Uh, and it does bring a lot of complexity. Um, so that the, the ask that we do get a little bit more frequently is like um, conditionals, uh, like if else. Uh, that's also not supported there. You can kind of emulate it fairly easily by basically inside your step doing a if something and then just not doing anything else. It, it does waste a, a resource, but that's how people have been going around it. It might change. It's something that we discuss periodically, but so far, no. Thank you. Hey, my name is Joe. Uh, it was a great presentation, very, very engaging. Thank you. And my question is, most of these models that you build will be dynamically fed with new data. In case you acquire new consumers, then you'd have more data. In that case, how do you make sure that your data engineering choices um, kind of retain the reproducibility? How do you test on the same training data? So yeah, you're right that the models are retrained periodically based on new data. Um, the reproducibility that we guarantee is that whatever, how your training worked will be the same way, but whether it'll produce the same results based on the data, no, that, that is, I mean, and on purpose in some sense, because you want your model to evolve. Uh, Metaflow in this particular, uh, right now, Metaflow doesn't really help you so much in detecting things like, is the quality of my model the same as the, the one previously, like is the data that was fed in uh, kind of similar to the data that I have seen before, stuff like that, or even at inference time, like is the you know data drift and all that stuff. We don't do that right now. That is something that we're actually looking into for uh, next year to like help you with uh, you know understanding your model a little bit better and, and and understanding whether or not your training matched what you had trained before and stuff like that. It is kind of going a little higher in the stack as you saw in that stack. So it's something that we're kind of a little bit leery of because we don't want also to kind of force people. We don't want to pick for data scientists like this is the way that you need to uh, handle uh, this. So Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, has Metaflow uh, replaced some of your uh, ETL pipelines? Is it uh, a tool that your uh, data engineers use? It's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say it's replaced the ETL pipelines. We still have ETL pipelines. Um, typically, um, Metaflow kind of sits between or like after an ETL pipeline. So you'll have an ETL pipeline running on Spark or whatever that will produce uh, a table. Uh, and that, that the production of uh, a new partition on that table, for example, will trigger the Metaflow job. So it works in conjunction. You could technically do your ETL with uh, Metaflow. It's just not necessarily the best fit. Spark is a good fit for certain things. It's a terrible fit for other things. Metaflow is a good fit for certain things and it's not as good of a fit for other things. So I would say they work together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I have time one for one more question. Uh, I had a question. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Um, so for Metaflow, so uh, you talked about the DAG. Is that mainly used by data scientists for training and then you know inference pipeline, or there are some other use cases? I'm not sure if that could be a question for a data scientist or you. Um, no, it's a good question. So um, yeah, basically Metaflow structures the code in, in a DAG form. The division of what goes in a step is up to the data scientist. A lot of data scientists, or some data scientists do exactly what you said. They basically have like a, a training step, and then they have a validation step, and then they might have like a batch inference step or something like that. Uh, other data scientists do something completely different. Uh, some of them, for example, will distribute their training for like, they'll train on different countries and stuff like that. So um, the we don't impose a particular division of the steps. Uh, we have some general recommendations. Usually the step ideally should fit on one machine. It's not a distributed step. So like if you want to access a data that won't fit on your machine, that's probably a bad idea. Um, and um, it also should kind of make sense from a semantic point of view, again, to the point where um, if some of your steps fail, you can then resume. It kind of makes sense if you know you have kind of a, a an actual semantically sound step that's done, then you can kind of resume for the rest. But it's completely up to the data scientist. All right, let's move for a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have two lightning talks. Uh, the first one is by Emmanuel from uh, airtrain.ai. One, two. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Emmanuel, uh, one of the makers of uh, Airtrain.ai, which is a, uh, a batch evaluation platform for large language models. And uh, today I want to talk about a few trends that I've noticed uh, in the LLM space and see how they can impact your, uh, your research in, in that field. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is sort of this trend. This is kind of the, the baseline narrative. As time goes on, models get bigger and bigger. Here on the x-axis, you have you have time. And here on the y-axis, you have a log 10 uh, scale of the number of parameters in those models. And as you can see, obviously, things get bigger and bigger. With GPT-4 all the way up there, we don't actually know exactly how many parameters are in GPT-4, but it's definitely uh, up there. And you can see that uh, from the moment that ChatGPT was released in November last year, then there was an explosion of, of large models. And you can see those models are extremely large, like 180 billion parameters for Falcon Air um, and, and so on. So there's nothing new here. And uh, those models are really impressive. I mean, we've all played with them. We're all very sort of impressed by uh, the quality of the output that they can generate. However, the problem is that they remain what I called wild luxuries. And I use those words on purpose. Why wild? Because very much like wild animals that are huge, they're hard to harness, they're hard to control, they're hard to, um, uh, to use in production. And why luxuries? Because they cost a lot of money. Uh, both in hardware, so if you want to run it yourself, you need to have access to GPUs, that's very expensive. And if you want to use the cloud API, like uh, OpenAI, for example, it costs a lot of money. So they're really wild luxuries. Uh, they come with tons of issues like safety, 
Uh, you know, you can't, you can't easily control those models because they don't run in your infrastructure. The output is very unpredictable. Latency is usually pretty high, so it's, it's slow to uh, building products around those models is, uh, is a little difficult because of that. Costs a lot of money uh, and so on. Some of those big models even have uh, licenses that don't really allow you to build products on, on top of them. So those models are great, but uh, it's kind of hard to, to build products around them. Uh, and on the other side, we can see that there is a quest uh, to, to use mo uh, language models on local machines, on laptops and, and desktop computers. So the quest for the, the desktop Llama. So I'm sure you're familiar with uh, all of these projects. You have Llama CPP up there, uh, which essentially is a C++ port of the Llama model, which runs other models than Llama. But uh, essentially, the goal of Llama.cpp is to run large models on your local machine. So it uses four-bit quantization. I'll talk about this in a, in a minute, uh, so that you can run those things on your laptop. So obviously, you're not going to run a production series from your laptop. But if you're trying to develop an application that uses a model, uh, then it's much easier if this model runs also on your laptop, because you can query it much faster. You don't have to pay every time you query it, and so on. There's those other projects out there. So Olama uh, is essentially a wrap around llama.cpp uh, that also lets you interact with models locally. And you can download like model files from Hugging Face and then run th those files on your local machine, uh, and it's, it's very practical. Uh, GPT-4 is actually a UI that looks very much like the, the chat GPT UI that also runs on your machine. So much faster to develop, much cheaper. Uh, what you can see here is, is the curve of their GitHub star, so you can see that they are, um, the adoption there is growing quite a lot. There's even an entire subreddit dedicated to local llamas. Uh, so people are really trying to run large models on smaller and smaller machines. There's even people that are doing research to run uh, LLMs on CPUs. So to try to quantize and, and sort of uh, prune the model to its core so that you can run it on CPUs without losing accuracy. So this is a trend to try to uh, make bigger and bigger models fit on smaller and smaller devices. So this is possible. One of the ways this is possible is due to quantization. So, I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with it, but essentially the idea of Quantization is that you try to find the weights in your uh, neural network that can be sort of compressed from 32 bits to 8 bits, uh, and that makes your model much smaller, so it uses much less memory. Inference is also much faster, so you can fit it on, on a smaller machine and it runs much faster. However, it does lose some accuracy, uh, which may or may not be a problem depending on your on your application. So this is a, an example of a, um, a hugging face repo where you have a whole bunch of model files here. It's all the same model. It's a chat fine tune of the 7 billion parameter Lama 2 model. And you can see the size of the file. This is a uh, six bit quantization. So it's about 5.5 gigabytes. And then you have a two bit quantization here is 2.8 gigabytes. So much smaller, much easier to fit in memory on your local machine. Obviously the performance in terms of the uh, generation uh, is going to be impacted by this quantization. And you can see this on this plot here. So if we just focus, for example, on the black um, on the black measurements here, the black square is the baseline. It's your 7B model uh, with using 16-bit uh, uh, floating point values, and all the other ones are quantizations. So as you can see, the more you quantize, uh, so the more the, the fewer bits you use to represent your weights, uh, the smaller your model is going to be, which is great. Uh, and then here on the y-axis, you have perplexity. So it essentially measures the quality of the generated output. And the more you quantize the model, uh, of course, the perplexity uh, rises. So obviously, it all depends on your level of tolerance for the quality of the output. Maybe when you're working on your local machine to develop, I don't know, your chain or, or your, your agent and so on, you don't need to have a high quality model. You just want to validate that everything works correctly. And when you want to move closer to production, then you switch over to maybe a GPT-4 or, or some other uh, large model. Uh, so this is how people are able to fit things onto smaller machines. Um, so another trend that is uh, being kind of very apparent now is that uh, you can fine tune a small model on, uh, on a high quality data set and you can compete, the quality of the output can compete with large models, models out there. And I'm going to show you two, two pieces of evidence to support this. 
The first one is this paper from Microsoft Research, I think came out in April last year, called Textbooks Are All You Need. And what they did is that they uh, published this model called Phi1, and it's a fairly small model, so 1.3 billion parameters. Um, and it was essentially fine-tuned on some very high-quality data. So they mentioned uh, textbook quality data from the web uh, and also synthetic data, set, synthetic data that was generated by GPT 3.5. So they um, took a small model, very small model, and fine-tuned it on very high-quality data set, and that is the key, the quality of your data set, and they achieved performance, well, it's being cut off. <laughs> well, the performance for this model is below the cutoff. I'm not sure how to show that. But essentially, uh, Phi1 performs at 50% uh, uh, courtesy on the human eval um, benchmark here. And if you look through the list, uh, there's only two models that are uh, better than, than Phi1. There's uh, Wizard Coder, which is the, the one at the bottom here, and then GPT-4 uh, with 67%. So obviously, GPT-4 is still uh, the best in class, but a very small model, only 1.3 billion parameters, is able to compete with uh, those much larger models. For example, here, Wizard Coder, which is the only one that beats Phi1 except GPT-4, is 16 billion. So as you can see, small model, high quality data set, performs very well on a specific task. In this case, it's code generation. So it loses the sort of generality that you have with those large language models. But uh, if you're trying to build an application for one specific use case, then you can get a similar performance with a much smaller model. Um, and uh, this is another piece of evidence that supports this, uh, this trend, is this Tiny Stories uh, paper that also came out last year, um, where essentially they trained extremely small models. So uh, here they say below 10 million parameters, uh, and they generated uh, Tiny Stories, essentially. So very short stories uh, that use word that can be understood by uh, three and four-year-old kids. Uh, so very simple stories with very simple uh, vocabulary. And so uh, they generated those using uh, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. So using those large models as sources of synthetic data. Um, and the performance here, uh, so here on the left, you have the prompt that they give to the model and the model is supposed to uh, complete the story. So find the end of the story for, for that prompt. And so you have here the results for different size of mod size models. Uh, and the rightmost column here is the benchmark. So uh, it's GPT-2 XL 1.5 billion parameter, which today would be considered small, but uh, compared to those much smaller ones, it is still a, a very large model. And uh, the color encodes the quality of the output. So for example, if you look at the very first line as an example, Alice was so tired when she got back home, so she went home. That's kind of a terrible uh, completion. Uh, and GPT-2 says outside, which also doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, the best model here is those um, uh, 28 million and 33 million parameter models, so straight to bed. And if you look overall, this 33 million parameter model performs better than, than all the other ones, including uh, GPT-2 Excel. So once again, for a very specific task, so completing uh, stories, very s uh, small stories that are in that are children. Uh, and if you use a small model and uh, fine tune it on a synthetic data set, you can beat or or um, or, e or sort of be on par with with larger models. Uh, so as you can see, the first trend is big model on small machines, and now small models can also achieve similar results than than large ones. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is synthetic data generation. So uh, before working on AirTrain, I used to work at Cruise, the, the uh, self-driving car company, and it was pretty common for us to uh, generate synthetic data. We had an entire simulation framework, uh, we called the metrics actually, uh, ironically, um, where we would generate, you know, we would use game engines to generate uh, fake scenes of San Francisco so that we could train and, and evaluate um, models without having to collect uh, all the miles that are necessary for it. So until recently, those uh, sort of model generation, uh, data generation products were actually pretty uh, hard to build uh, and were expensive to use. But now with uh, a generative AI, uh, it's very straightforward to generate a data set. You can really do it yourself uh, using, for example, GPT-4. This is an example that I did really this afternoon. You write this prompt into GPT-4, so generate 100 simple stories about everyday life. Each story should have no more than four sentences. Stories should use one of three language modes, casual, common, distinguished. The output should have the following format, and then I give the data format that I need. And I put this into GPT-4, and there you go. I have a data set 
with here's not only 10, but I could have 100 where sto with stories with different uh, modes of, uh, of English. Uh, and then you can, you can check that it actually works. For example, for casual mode, I have yo, so Jake totally missed the bus this morning. Obviously, casual uh, language, common language. Emma, Emma found an old photograph in her attic and then distinguished upon the stroke of dawn, Sir Edward uh, embarked on a solitary walk. So uh, this is pretty high quality data. Obviously, if you wanna generate a high quality data set, you have to iterate multiple times on, on, on those prompts. Uh, but the idea here is that you don't need to pay a company or build your own systems anymore to generate synthetic data. You can do this really easily from those, from those models. So uh, I think you're starting to see a pattern here. You can do many of those things uh, without having to invest a lot into infrastructure. So smaller models on smaller machines, fine tune small models for specific tasks using synthetic data. Um, so the, the title of the talk was Oracle and uh, Worker Bees. And the reason I use those words is that I see a near-term future where there's a handful of what I call Oracle models out there. So very large models that are very hard to train, require a lot of data, a lot of resources, a lot of GPUs to train, and that we use for tasks that are uh, you know, gen general reasoning, uh, creativity, generate those, those data sets, also serve as so judges or, or uh, evaluation benchmarks for a whole set of smaller models that are dedicated to more specific use cases. So for example, if, you're, uh, if, if you wanna use a model in your application to extract uh, data from a user input and format a JSON payload to send to an API, your model may not need to have billions and billions of parameters and know everything about world history from the dawn of time. Maybe you can have a much smaller model, maybe a billion parameters that you fine tune on this specific task using a synthetic data set. So you can imagine a future where you have this uh, sort of slew of very specialized small models that you fine tuned uh, on a specific data set. And it doesn't need you know, millions of rows to fine tune a data set. Sometimes with a few thousand, you can actually get some decent results. And those, so we'll be trained with data generated by those large models and also will be evaluated and, and scored. So uh, those models will much, be much cheaper to train, fine tune and run on your own infrastructure. You will actually be able to run them on-prem. Um, and so that means that you can put control guards around it. You can uh, you know, monitor uh, everything you need to, uh, to monitor for a, a sort of safe production deployments. So a much more manageable set of models than those huge models that, that are out there right now. Um, so uh, the future that I see for, for models, for production models, is really this set of small, of uh, very large models that know everything about, about the world and are able to do many different tasks. And then uh, a huge amount of small models that are, that are uh, fine-tuned for specific tasks that you can much more easily manage and even, even run locally. Um, so this is kind of uh, why we built AirTrain in the first place. We, we think that the industry is going to move towards fine-tuning their own small models. And we think that uh, fine-tuning starts with evaluation. So if you don't have a good evaluation harness, uh, it's kind of useless to fine-tune. If you can't uh, have a way of evaluating how good your model is for your task, uh, it's kind of useless to spend you know, GPU time to fine-tune. And so that's why we, we built AirTrain, so that uh, users can easily build their own evaluation harness uh, with their own metrics specific to their own use case with their own specific data sets. Most of the evaluation techniques you see out there use metrics that are not necessarily relevant to your use case, things like blue and, and rouge and, and so on. Same for all the benchmarks. What really works better is to use another model to grade the output of your, of your model. And this is what we're trying to build in, in AirTrade. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, I have time for one question, and then after that, you can meet him uh, towards the end of the day. I, you can ask him after that. Thank you. Um, hi, um, thanks for the talk. You mentioned the ability for small models to match the performance of big models on specific tasks, and that you're building evaluation where you want to use a model to evaluate existing models. So do you have a special small model trained for this evaluation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the fact is you don't necessarily know ahead of time what your users are going to try to evaluate. The dimensions is this, uh, you know, groundedness, creativity, politeness, and all those things. If you uh, were, for example, working at 
a Pinterest or 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 some or a Netflix or as the speakers that we saw before, you may have a specific area that you're trying to uh, to evaluate for. So, for example, if you're doing recommendations or or, or things like that, in our case, uh, we're still to being quite generic. Uh, so we're still using uh, larger models that that we're um, sort of prompting and using a lot of uh, few short prompting to teach uh, the the scoring model with a few examples what is a low score and what is a high score. Uh, as we move forward, we will uh, go into fine-tuning smaller models, but we still have to, re uh, to retain certain uh, generality for, for the model because different users will try to evaluate different aspects of the model. But there is a future in which we can use sort of a mixture of experts model where you have a routing model that is trained to choose another model from a set of smaller models, depending on what the user is trying to, to evaluate. Awesome. Thank you, Manuel. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. All right. Our last talk for this evening is by Ofer from Victara. This will be another lightning talk. All right, can you hear me? Can you see? Okay, great. Well, hi, everyone. Sorry. This, uh, allow. Um, I'll move this away. No. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, hi, I'm Ofer. I'm uh, from Victara. I run uh, uh, developer relations at Victara. And, um, you know, you can see a little bit of my background, but uh, I was fortunate enough to actually work on LMs uh, kind of early on since 2019. Uh, fortunately, in hindsight, of course, it became this popular topic these days uh, when uh, GPT-2 just launched. And it was kind of interesting to see um, how this evolved over time. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about is hallucinations in LMs and how to address them. And, to explain what hallucination, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen or heard about it, but this is one of my favorite examples. When I asked ChatGPT a couple months ago, um, did Will Smith ever hit anyone? Of course, the answer is no. He's a, he's a great actor, very, very nice to people. This was before you know, this happened, which is where uh, you know, uh, ChatGPT stopped its training before that time. So it doesn't know this fact, right? Is this too loud? I OK. So. Um, so why do we have these hallucinations in LLMs? Um, so before I go there, I'm gonna give you two main reasons, um, but I wanna try to define it kind of simply. I mean, there's a lot of definitions and some people argue that, oh, you shouldn't call it hallucination, you should call it something else. Uh, I'm gonna forget about that. I don't care that much about the terminology, but the idea is that it gives you a, a, a answer that's either incorrect or unfaithful to the provided source content, right? Um, and um, why do LLMs hallucinate? Well, uh, before I go to the two reasons, I want to give you a little bit of a conceptual paradigm that I'm going to use in these two reasons, which is that an LLM has some kind of a knowledge graph in it. Now, it's not a tangible knowledge graph. It's not something we, I think many of you here are data scientists, and the data scientists tend to, knowledge graph has been a concept that we've been using for the last maybe decade or, or more. I don't mean in that sense an actual tangible knowledge graph, but it's, it's useful to think about the knowledge it captures during its training as some kind of knowledge graph. And um, when you ask the LM some question, in reality, it kind of completes the sentence. But if you think about it in terms of knowledge, it sort of relies on its knowledge graph to generate the response, if you will, uh, what it learned during training. And so, um, the first reason why LMs hallucinate uh, is really when um, you ask a question which is just not in knowledge graph. This is the example I showed you. It just doesn't have the example, doesn't have the data, uh, so it doesn't know what to do. Now, 
LLMs are trained to complete, to do something, to give you some completion. They're not trained to say, I don't know. Um, and so they would probably pick the most highly probable uh, response that they can from the knowledge graph that they have, and they'll give you that response. Now, you've seen, those of you who tracked GPT-4, ChatGPT over the last few months, you've seen that that has become better. Uh, there are techniques to sort of like caveat the answer and, or refuse the answer where ChatGPT will say, oh, I'm just a chatbot, I'm, I'm until 2021, and I don't know, don't take me too seriously. And that's something called a refusal. Um, and that's okay, but I think generally that's kind of a kind of a wrapper around it that, that makes this refusal. It's not kind of the basic training. Um, so that's one reason. Um, the other reason is that, um, well, it's actually more, the answer to the question isn't a knowledge graph, but you perceive it as incorrect because you don't agree with it, right? It could be that it's based on fictional content or sometimes subjective opinions and things that have multiple multiple ideas around, so multiple beliefs. So that's a lot of times where people just get a response and, and don't agree with it. And so, um, so, so this, is what, this is why LMs hallucinate, at least today. Um, so how do people address hallucinations? Um, first of all, I wanna mention there's a lot of research going on around doing that. Um, I'm gonna mention a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I think it was mentioned uh, earlier too, cleaner data, less biased data, you know, uh, clean, clean books and all this data sets. A lot of, it, it's kind of an unknown problem, but people believe, and there's some evidence to show that uh, cleaner data could help and remove hallucination. Um, and that's one area. The other one is uh, RLHF and other techniques like it. Uh, RLHF stands for reinforcement learning with human feedback. That's famously what uh, OpenAI used to improve the quality of, of ChatGPT. Many others have used it as well. Um, and I think it's gonna continue to be a, a good technique to, to help with that. Um, improved prompting. So there's techniques to, people do a lot of work of uh, how to uh, help ChatGPT do a better job by asking these things multiple times and there's all kinds of tricks like that. So you can read a chain of thought, tree of thought, a couple other papers that, that deal with that. And then the last thing, which I wanna talk about and, and go deeper a little bit today is retrieval augmented generation, also known as uh, grounded generation. Uh, so Victor, we like to call it grounded generation because we think it, it stands for GG, which is a kind of a gaming concept, um, but actually it, did, it didn't catch up. So we're staying with what everybody calls it, which is rag, which we just think is not as fun, but it is what it is. So, um, so what is uh, what is RAG, um, and how does it work? Uh, so RAG is essentially helps LLM focus on the facts that matter to provide a more accurate response. So, you start with uh, your data. This could be you know PDFs or data in some other format from a database or whatever. And uh, you, it's in a, in the database. And when when a user asks a query, the LLM essentially you know, looks at the data using the retrieval engine, pulls the most relevant facts from that data that are supposed to be useful to answer this query and generates a response. So one way to think about it is like a, a closed book test versus an open book test, right? Open book test is where you, you have a question and you can, you know, go look at your books. And uh, if you're fast enough, you can read the books efficiently enough, you can find the right answers and answer the question that way. So. Uh, that's, a, that's a good analogy to think about that. Um, so this is probably going to be the, the longest slide, but I want to show you how RAG uh, works kind of in, in detail, what the process looks like. Um, so there's kind of two and a half flows here that I want to share. One is the blue one where um, you take the data that you want to use for RAG. This is your data, your custom data, data that, of course, ChatGPT would never know about, right, because it's, it's custom to you. And there's a, a little piece here that's usually like document processing. So extracting the text from the document. If it's a PDF, you just want the text. You don't want the whole binary thing. If it's a PowerPoint, um, you do something called uh, chunking. 
um, which uh, is also somewhat problematic. Sometimes people don't know how to chunk. Do I chunk the text into smaller pieces or larger pieces? Um, and then you run the chunks of text, which are usually, you know, maybe 500 or 1,000 characters or something like that, uh, through something called an embedding model. This is not what most people know about in LLMs. That's the, the GPT-4 is not an embedding model, but both OpenAI and Cohere and us and others have embedding models. And those are things that take the text and make it into a, a what's called an embedding vector, which is then source stored in a vector database or a vector store. Here also, sometimes you of course have to store the text itself to be able to map between uh, vectors and text. And then when you run a query, you run the query against the same embedding model. So you create an embedding uh, for the query itself. And then embedding is then matched with the vector store to retrieve the most relevant facts. And the nice thing about these embedding models is they, they create kind of something that has the semantic meaning of what you want. So if you ask uh, a query about who is Will Smith, it'll, it'll kind of have you know, semantic meaning that vectors who have things around Will Smith will, will, be, will have a similar place in this uh, multidimensional vector space. So that's kind of the trick of a vector spray, uh, search or semantic search. So it pulls the right facts from here and then essentially constructs a prompt to GPT or Llama 2 or whatever you want to use that essentially says, hey, GPT, here's the question. Here's these 10 facts about that are re really relevant for you to answer this question. Please answer the question. So it's a little bit oversimplified, but that's generally what, what happens. And then GPT goes ahead and, or whoever, whichever model you use here, goes ahead and answers the question. There's sometimes an optional step where people do some validation of the response. For example, if it's an enterprise, um, you might wanna check for a language that's not allowed in a response in a work environment or whatever like that. And then uh, you get the response. So that's kind of the, the two main flows. One thing I wanna mention too is sometimes there's a kind of an action that could come out of that where you take the response and let's say you send it in an email to someone automatically. So there could be like an automation of the action step after the response. Um, so that's really how you build any reg flow. And you know uh, what, what we do at Victor is essentially put it all in a box, right? So that's why recently people started calling us uh, our service a rag in a box, uh, but it's uh, really, doing reg as the managed service where all this complexity i just described how to chunk and how to process the data and how to do the vector store properly and efficiently at scale with security and doing all that all this stuff becomes kind of part of what we do and all the if you want to build an application all you do is you index your data here through there's an api to index data there's an api to query and you can um, build your application much more quickly and scale to whatever scale you wanna, you wanna go there. Um, so that's really what we do. And uh, a couple of reasons why you wanna, when do you wanna consider using RAG? It's not good for all use cases of LMs. There's other use cases that it doesn't solve. But the main uh, reason you should, you should think about, consider using it is, um, it again, as I said, augments LM with your own data that GPT itself would not know about uh, to reduce hallucinations. Um, the results are explainable, which is kind of interesting. So I'll show you a demo in a minute, but you have citations. You can have, you can say, hey, I'm responding in this way to your question. And here's the source, because I have the facts. Here's the facts I, I base this on. So you can have explainability in that sense a little bit, which is uh, increasing user trust. Um, again, the data is never used to train uh, the LLM. That's something that a lot of people are worried about these days. Um, and then, you know, it's uh, relatively inexpensive to implement and use. You don't need to train anything. You don't need human feedback. We talked about RLHF. That's a very expensive process to run and manage. Um, and uh, generally, it's complementary to anything else. So when GPT-5 comes out or Gemini comes out or whoever the next model will be or Llama 3, you know, everything will be better in a RAG space as well. It'll be just uh, better all around. Um, and lastly, I want to show you this, uh, this demo. This is a, a sample application that we built just to demonstrate uh, the capabilities of this. I'm going to actually, uh, oops, I'm going to try to run it. Is this showing okay? Yes, this is the, the live uh, app. So this is a, 
an example um, actually uh, that you know you can see we crawled uh, news articles from these five sources. Uh, I'm gonna try to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, from these five sources, the BBC, NPR, Fox News, etc., um, and we keep regularly crawling new new uh, articles every day. And then you can ask a question. For example, this is actually as of this morning. Those of you who have not seen, like the White House had done some regulation, but this is a question we did, you know, for the last couple of months was here. But should AI be regulated, right? And so what happens here is using the Vector API after everything was indexed, it uh, uh, sends the query to the system. And you get uh, a response you can see here with some you know citations and the citations are listed here so if i want to see oh what is number six here i can click on this and go and see and if i want to go deeper i can click on this and actually read the, the article but it gives me sort of the major facts that this was based on um and a nice thing about this too is that it works in you know multiple languages so you can sort of like say hey i want the the response in, in Russian or some other language. And it, because again, it's, it's a semantic space. It actually does a, a really good job in, in multiple languages. Um, okay, now I have to wait to show you. Okay, here we go. All right. So um, going back to this, um, uh, one last thing is uh, if you're interested to learn more about RAG, we're actually, it's a timely thing, but we're actually having a, a hackathon, an online hackathon that starts this Friday. Great opportunity to, for people to try it out, learn about it, experiment with it. If you're interested to learn more about this, this is a great opportunity. Um, so you can um, uh, go and, and uh, sign up for that. Um, and yeah, and yeah, I'll take any questions now. Yes. Uh, I have one question for now. Yeah. Oh. Hopefully this is an okay one. Um, how, is it possible to for techniques like RAG to sort of weigh out what uh, you know? How much emphasis to pro provide on like the the augmented data versus the base data that it's been trained with, and how do you sort of figure that out? So uh, it's a great question. So for the most part, I would say um, you want the the response to be based on the the knowledge that's in in this facts, and less so on 